Hello and welcome to MMA Crips Fighting Talk, the end of Anderson Silva. For today's show, we'll be discussing various topics from last night's UFC 168. Join us to go five hard rounds today will be Brian Hunt, Greg Marshall and Chris McMillan. Okay, starting with round one and Anderson Silva versus Chris Weidman. Last night's main event saw Chris Weidman keep his middleweight crown against challenger Anderson Silva. There was more concern than joy as the fans left the arena last night. Anderson Silva broke his leg as Chris Weidman checked one of his kicks. I have to ask, guys, do you think this will be the last time we see Anderson Silva fight? You know, you've got to factor in his age and how severe the injury was. That question's for you first, Brian. Uh, I think so. Um, I, I don't agree with the... I mean, it's not a good injury. It's a, He didn't break a fucking hangnail or a nail or something. But I, I think if it's a clean break, it's actually a better injury than a torn knee. So from that aspect of it, it's it's gruesome to watch. Um, it, it was gruesome to hear. I mean, the smack. You thought maybe it was a foot on thigh, but uh, it was there was the bone fucking cracking. So I think I think if he's a 33 year old Anderson Silva, yes, he comes back because I don't think the injury is as severe as it may appear. Because again, a good break is better than a a knee being torn up. I mean, knees are year pluses. Bones are. Or eight to twelve weeks. Now, how much other shit going on in there? Did it shatter? I, I don't know the details of it, but I, if I had a choice, would I want a break on, broken leg or a torn knee? I'll take the broken leg. Um, not in front of millions of people watching or anything like that, but but yes, uh, I, I think it's done. Age, back to back losses, uh, questionable losses, still still losses, and uh, just uh, just everything putting together. Um, Great, greatest fighter in UFC history, but uh, goodbye, Anderson Silva. Greg, do you think this is the last time we'll see Anderson Silva fight? I think it probably should be, but I don't think it will be. Um, I agree with Brian that the leg, the leg break is a lot easier than an ACL or whatever. Um, they've already said that the surgery was a success. He's got the metal rod placed in his leg and that he should be out three to six months maximum. So... He would probably only be out that long if between fights anyway, so he's not going to be set back too far with this. Do you not know, um, think it'll affect his style, though, Greg? Because Anderson Silva, you know, he's springy, he likes to use his movement. That's um, basically again, a key to his fighting style. Uh, do you think it could hamper him? Again, it's just a leg break. It's not as if it's a knee or, or that. I think a leg break doesn't really affect you too much in the long term. Um, he, he should quit, but I've got a funny feeling... His uh, competitive spirit will have him want to fight a couple more times, especially this nagging Roy Jones Jr. fight that he seems to be wanting. It's Bisping um, too. Bisping's been talking about a lot. I think Bisping and Diaz both are two other guys that could possibly have for a couple of fun fights to finish his career. don't think he'll want to finish on a loss. Chris, do you think this is the last time we'll see Anson Silva fight? Um, I don't know at this stage, but I hope it is. I mean, I do not want to see him fight again. And the reason why is, I agree with what you guys are saying, that it's true. It's He's not going to have to go through nine months of ridiculous rehab like GSP did with his torn ACL. But the thing is, is that now he's 0-2 he's two, to Chris Wyvern. He's not going to get a third shot, regardless of how, you know, Vitor Belfort's been, been waiting long enough. He deserves his shot. He's not going to get a third crack at Weidman anytime soon or possibly ever. Let's not forget the middleweight division is stacked. So what else is there to prove? There is nothing else for the man to prove. I mean, don't get me wrong, I would love to he could make some interesting fights out there, but honestly, now I may I seem to focus on this a lot, but he's had he's sixteen and two in the UFC, fought everyone that's been in front of him, caused some of the biggest holy shit moments ever. I just you know, unless Anderson's gonna be involved in, you know, Hugh in legendary fights like against John Jones or GSP, which there's, I mean, the GSP fight's never going to happen. I'm sure of it. I've been sure of that for a while. The John Jones fight, listen, after what we saw, I don't think anyone really wants to, The a lot of buzz for that fight is gone, I'm sure. So unless we see Anderson Silva in those mega fights, which I just don't feel, you know, I can just due to whatever's happened throughout the, throughout his career, they're just not going to happen. So 
I just don't see why Anderson would risk his health when he's done so much for the sport, you know, just to have a couple of fights which are just the same as he's had when he was 16-0 in the UFC. So he's got nothing else to prove. I'm happy to see him retire. Now, uh, I want to focus on Chris Weidman for a minute. He beat the unbeatable fighter in Anderson Silva. The first fight went down as the only one because Anderson Silva was showboating. Uh, he had a chance to rectify it. was an old fluke last night. Once again, another strange ending to a Weidman Anderson Silva fight. If you were Chris Weidman, how would you be feeling right now with two murky victories over Anderson Silva? Do you think it damages his reputation as being one of the best middleweights in USC right now? That question is for you first, Brian. Um, yes, it does damage. Uh, should it? No, it, it shouldn't. Uh, I mean, I, 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 it, it's a hard one. Do you view him as beating Anderson Silva twice or not being beat by Anderson Silva twice? It's, it's hard. Um, how does he feel? Uh, I know I was slightly disappointed. Same with the guy I was watching the fights with. That he rose his hands and walked around the ring as if it was a devastating KO or something. I was disappointed. I understand the adrenaline dump and all that stuff. But that is so far how I would want to win a fight. Is a guy breaks a leg that I'm checking. Um, I don't celebrate that. I, I don't view that as a victory. It's a mishap. Um, if he trips on the fucking logo and tears his knee, do you celebrate that? Woohoo! I mean, it's... <laughs> That that part kind of bothered me a little bit. And, yes, he's concerned afterwards, and we didn't hear Greg Jackson, hey, hey, uh, pretend that you give a shit. No, I, he's a genuine guy. I don't think he did not want to win that fight. He wanted it to be like round one for three more rounds. I mean, so he should feel okay. Uh, he did beat Anderson Silva twice now. That The first round where he damn near knocked him out standing and then maybe he woke up on the way down. I'm not sure. He, he did everything he was supposed to do. He didn't do anything wrong. So he, he shouldn't. Until he beats Vitor, uh, he, he's not going to get the respect he earns. Uh, he deserves. He won't. But once he beats Vitor, unless Vitor trips on a fucking logo and tears his knee up, and uh, then we're like, holy shit, what's with this Weidman dude? <laughs> he can't win a fucking clean fight. But uh, until, he, until he beats Vitor, he's going to have a question of bar, mark around him. Deservingly, no, not really, but understandably, yes. Jimmy Mano is going through the same thing right now. He keeps having um, murky victories where the guys get injured or whatever, they fall over at something. So it's a it's a shame that he won that way. Greg, same question for you. Um, well, my perspective is different. Um, I don't see the first fight as being murky or poor in any way. He uh, took advantage of the situation and knocked him out. He can't get any better than that. Um, he did exactly what he had to do and knocked him out. Second fight, again, some people might not view it as a, a win, but he, when asked in the post-fight conference, he said that he trained for that. He trained for the leg breaker, as they call it, in his uh, camp. He trained to put his knee in a position to break Anderson Silva's leg. Uh, he he was planning that, that move throughout the whole fight. Um, is it good? Maybe not, but he still won the fight and it was something that they trained on. So I think he'll be happy with how it finished. Whether he should be, I don't know. But Chris, same question for you there. Um, yes, it is definitely going to... It, I agree completely with what, um, with what Brian said, that until he beats someone recognisable like Vitor Belfort and beats him definitively, then he's not going to get the respect he deserves, and I'm, that's very unfortunate. You know, I mentioned this as I mentioned this to Brian, you know, earlier on today that this was I, this was possibly the worst result the UFC could have asked for um, for for this particular main event. Um, so yeah, it's it doesn't look it doesn't look good, but then again, Chris Weidman he should. He should get the respect he deserves, but I guess I think it's more so. Just, it, it reminds me a lot of how I felt about Chris Weidman going into the first Anderson Silva fight. Everyone was talking about his skills. We had seen what this guy was capable of, but he hadn't had that breakthrough fight against a top top five star yet. And now that he's and now he's had you know 
two back-to-back performances against arguably the best mixed martial artists of all time, but they both had controversy. And, you know, it's fair enough to say, well, Wyvern was beating him up in that first round and almost finished him. We've seen Anderson Silva lose first rounds before to um, two top wrestlers. You know, Dan Henderson, Chael Sonnen came back to beat those guys in the second round. Chael Sonnen, the first fight, I think you guys know what I'm talking about. So it, it doesn't, unfortunately, yes, it does hinder his reputation at the moment. I agree to- totally with Brian. It's unfair, but you can understand where it's coming from. Um, but if I was Chris Weidman, I wouldn't be worried because I, I wouldn't be concerned because, like I said, there's no point in, you know, Vitor deserves his shot and there's more guys behind him. So I think he's just going to have to accept that, you know, this didn't happen the way we wanted it to, but we're just going to have to move on. You know, GSP and Anderson, biggest talked about, most talked about fight in UFC history, never happened. Fans just have to move on. That's what Chris Weidman has to do. And I'm sure he will do that. Okay, moving on to round two. Ronda Rousey versus Misha Tate. We had a discussion last show prior to this. Was Ronda Rousey versus Misha Tate the biggest fight in women's MMA history? We all sort of concluded in terms of entertainment and rivalry, it actually was. Not so much in terms of skill set. We all sort of felt Ronda Rousey was too good for Misha Tate. Uh, It actually turned into a back and forth well match battle last night. As Misha Tate was the first woman to take Ronda Rousey into the second and third round. I don't think I've ever seen a more entertaining women's fight as I did last night, guys. Was that the best women's MMA fight you've ever seen there, Brian? Um, boy, uh, out of skill, yes. The, uh, the Gino Cyborg fight was very entertaining, but it was more cat fight. Uh, just the energy of that fight was, uh, falling all each over. I mean, of course, Strike Force is calling it, oh, great takedown. No, the, the, the bitches fell. I mean, come on. But that was an exciting fight. That was a very, very exciting fight. But the skill level last night was a different level. I mean, those were skilled fighters. Now, the game plan of fucking trying to take down Ronda Rousey, I mean, uh, that that irritated me. That That's just so not smart on so many levels. <laughs> you'd think after three times of shooting, getting judo thrown on your ass and back, you'd, uh, you'd learn, but um, but that didn't happen. So it was a very exciting fight. It was, it was a fun fight to watch. The... The growth of Ronda Rousey is physically as a fighter. Mentally, no, but physically as a fighter is extremely impressive. Greg, was that the best women's MMA fight you've ever seen? It's definitely one of the best. A um, couple of good ones in, the, uh, in Victor recently. Obviously, the, the Michelle Waters and Jessica Penn fight where Waters and damn near got her arm broken and then came back and damn near broke what, uh, Jessica Penn's arm. That was a a good fight but um, last night uh, you couldn't ask for any more Rousey did exactly what she had to do and Tate was curiously strange with her game plan uh, I don't know what holes she claimed to have seen in Ronda's game because she never aimed for any she kept <laughs> play, she kept playing exactly into Ronda's game she, she closed the gap got stuck tried to take her down got taken down herself and when everybody can tell that the, the way to beat Ronda is to keep the gap and pick her off with striking, and she did none of that. Um, I think Tate's got a long way to, to go if she thinks she's going to get another shot at the title there anyway. I love the up kicks from me, she said last night. Yeah. She actually, I believe she hit Ronda with one of those kicks. Do you think she hit one of those kicks there, Greg? I, I think she definitely did, because when she did, Ronda did back up. Um, I was surprised she didn't back up earlier on. She obviously liked the idea that Tate was on the ground and didn't want to let her up, but she she eventually let her up when she got hurt. Chris, was that the best women's MMA fight you have ever seen? Yes, it was, and the reason why is simply because of the storyline going in, going into the fight, and this is why a lot of people, a lot of experts pick uh, Gustafsson versus John Jones to be over Diego Sanchez and Gil Melendez and Mark Hunt and Antonio Silva, simply because Gustafsson was a major underdog. You know, he's beating John Jones up until the last minutes of the fourth round, almost gets knocked out. You know, the storylines and the twists were amazing. That's what this fight had, you know. 
Ronda Rousey and Misha Tate. You know, Misha Tate was just such a huge underdog. Everyone thought she was going to get smashed. I personally didn't. And she, and she really just showed what she's capable of. She stuffed a, a, several of Ronda Rousey's takedowns. You know, better, did get the better up of the, sorry, the better of the stand-up exchanges besides being in the clinch. And I agree with what both Brian and Greg said. Misha Tate has one of the weirdest game plans I've ever seen in my life. Which, I mean, you know, she didn't. She seemed to be so overconfident that she could battle Ronda Rousey on the on the ground. That, you know, that's what she was going for. Why? I have no idea. She should have stayed up on the feet because, like I said, when she did, when it did stay on the feet, I did feel her getting more momentum than Rousey was. But the fact that she was able to, you know, she gets taken down, and everyone's like, okay, here we go again, and then suddenly. You, suddenly she gets out of armbar attempts, then she's on the mount, then it gets reversed, then they're standing up again, Misha, Misha tags her on the feet, she gets taken down again, armbar attempt, reversed, etc. All of that, eventually Rousey gets the armbar, all the twists, everything that happened, it was the best woman's fight I've ever seen. I was on the end of my seat, the old fucking fight, I was like, it's her, fucking it's her, she's like, she's rocking Ronda, Ronda's going back, she's staggering, I'm like, fuck no, jump on her! And the fucking up kits was just staggering. She got up. She missed a few punches. I was going crazy on the shit. Now, when you when you're up off the seat like that and you're yelling at the telly, that means it's a good fucking fight. And literally, if the fight if the night ended there, the UFC 168 card ended on that fight, I'd be happy. That was definitely the best women's MMA fight I've ever seen. It surpassed the expectations I had for it. Now I want to talk about Ronda Rose's heel turn last night, guys. For you non-pro wrestling fans, that means she's turned to the dark side. <laughs> we <laughs> we sort of seen the fans turn against Ronda Rousey during the airing of the Ultimate Fighter 18. She refused to shake Misha Tate's hand last night, which in turn sealed the heel turn for me. Would you agree that Ronda Rousey is the bad girl of MMA now? And do you think it's a good or a bad thing for the USC, Brian? Um, God, I, I, I don't... It's it's not a bad thing, and I, I don't agree that she's completely turned heel. I, I is the issue I have with Ronda is talking out of both sides of her face. Either become Brock Lesnar, or don't. I, I think she has a personality of a Brock Lesnar, which is very un um, likable, just to the point. Um, all she wants to do is fight. Blah 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 blah. But she get she got too emotional. I mean, even in Nick Diaz, I think most of the time, um, shook GSP's hand after the fight. Now, thirty seconds later, he won a fucking rematch and called him a pussy. It's like a girl, blah blah blah. But, but after the fight, he still did that. That's part of the sport. I, I would love to see it ended right there. I, I would. I mean, the fight is over. You won. Great. Shake hands. Move on to the next fight. But, I. She, I don't think she wants to accept it. She says the booing doesn't bother her. It does. I mean, as soon as she got the loud booing, she's like, well, Misha's a great fighter, blah, blah, blah. Just, uh, she spat on my back, whatever. Um, no, just, just fucking do like Brock Lesnar did. Yeah, I'm going to go home, fuck my wife, drink a Coors Light, suck it, and <laughs> and, and and own it. I mean... Hey, Brian, could just, you imagine Ronda Rose here? I'm going to go home, I'm going to suck my boyfriend's cock. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'll f- fucking own it. I mean, uh, I'm going to have my boyfriend lay on top of me, and uh, uh, I'm going to fucking armbar his ass, too. I mean, whatever. It just just o- own the character. What I despise about John Jones is he's fake. He, he's, he, I view him as oh, being God, so... Oh, God, that as well. I, Greg Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, it just... He's not genuine. I, I don't care who you are. Just be that. Just be that person. And, and, and own it. That, that, that's it. I, I don't care if you're a douchebag or you're the nicest guy in the world. Just be who you are. And that's what I don't think Rhonda is. And again, she's a young girl. It's a lot of fame. It's a lot of attention coming at her. And she's just not handling it really well at this point. But um, yeah, people are going to love to hate her. It draws fights. People hate, loved or hated Brock Lesnar. Um, but but he he had all that practice from the wrestling days of how to, how to handle that, and Ronda doesn't have that. I mean, she's still trying to win people over. She's still doing the late night television circuits, um, and and sometimes she's really likable. I mean, if her 
if her meds are in the proper alignment or the moons are in the right alignment, whatever it is, she's a very likable person. Um, but she, she shows this character every now and then. I, I don't think it's going to be a solid heel. I think she's going to change. I think, I think they're going to promote her as a likable Ronda now. Well, you mentioned Brock Lesnar. I think she could basically pass as Brock Lesnar's little sister, you know. She has the blonde hair <laughs> and the <Yeah>. bean mug. <laughs> Greg, would you agree Ronda Rousey is a bad girl of women's MMA now? Uh, do you think it's a good or a bad thing for the UFC? Um, right now she's, she is, but I don't think it's going to be last long because it's purely for one reason, Misha Tate. I think once the Tate fight's gone, it's going to change completely. Um, she's already been uh, interviewed that i seen a couple of days ago with Katz and Gano and the two of them were laughing and joking and having a good time um, it's just Misha Tate that's the only reason that she's like that just one reason alone so for that reason I don't think it's going to last long although they might try I think the UFC may try and play it out a bit longer because of what our next fight is she's facing uh, uh, Sarah McMahon obviously next and it makes sense to kind of keep her as a heel against the, the Olympic silver medalist and the good girl of the can see it just been played out a wee bit longer but she won't be for long I don't think she's going to keep that character for long at all Chris would you agree Ronda Rousey is a bad girl of women's MMA now and uh, do you think it's a good or a bad thing for the UFC first of all I quickly want to say that there is that I do not buy for one second that the UFC portrayed her bad, that she was portrayed badly on top that's who she is I am sure of it so I just wanted to get that out there because the UFC would not make their champion look bad just for the sake of it. No way. Um, is she the bad girl? Uh, no, I wouldn't say so. I mean, again, it's just this fight. I mean, look, while I consider the Misha Tate gets more, gets undeserving hate for this, for this rivalry, she's not the, Ronda Rousey is not the only girl to have a problem with her. For all of a sudden, it seems like Katz and Garno doesn't seem to like her. And, you know, there are plenty of girls in strike force who have had issues with Misha Tate. So I think it was just the fact that Ronda just couldn't get on with Misha. And, you know, and her insecurity was, you know, Misha knew exactly how to play with her insecurity. So, um, and I don't think anyone else is going to do that. I mean, unless Alexis Davis tries to, tries to play mind games with her, which I doubt she will. I don't think any, I don't think she's going to be portrayed as the bad girl or whatever. Um, only if she chooses to, you know, say things like she said before the Sarah Sarah Kaufman fight, which is I'm going to rip her arm off and throw it and throw it to a corner afterwards and <laughs> whatever, like you know, stuff like that, which honestly doesn't really need to be said. But unless she chooses to say things like that, she's not going to. I don't think she's going to be portrayed in a bad bad way or whatever. Is it bad for the UFC that she is like this? No, I don't think so at all. Because, because the fact is, people want to see her get. People wanted to see her get her butt whooped. You know, first first thirty seconds of the first round, people, the entire arena was chanting Misha. So, people just want to see her get. A lot of people want to see her get beat, which is great for the UFC because they it means they have a champion who whom you love to hate. So that so I don't see it being a problem for the UFC at all, and. Um, as far as her betrayal, as how she carries herself, well, listen, I've already discussed my thoughts on, on Ronda Rousey's um, maturities, whatever, and and how secure she is. Um, she's just going to betray herself, however she feels in the moment. If she feels like she wants to, she wants to take her take everything out on on random reporters, then then she will do that. If she feels she wants to be a lovely sweetheart and start hugging and kissing everybody, then she will do that. If she decides she wants to give she wants to give the finger and randomly call out Misha Tate and Brian Caraway just because she feels like it, she will do that. So just be prepared for a lot of it. Um, for a lot of um, uh, what's the word? Just be prepared for a lot of weird stuff and um, inconsistencies from her. But no, I don't think it's bad for for the UFC at all. Okay, moving on to round three. Travis Brown versus Josh Barnett. Going into last night's fight between Josh Barnett and Travis Brown, Barnett was the favourite, and even a few guys from the crypt felt Barnett was too too strong for Travis Brown. I won't name no names there. 
Scottish Greg and Derek Cliff. Okay, uh, it's okay, I'll accept that responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Were you surprised at how quickly and easily Travis Brown finished Josh Barnett last night, Greg? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, Barnett's known to be a difficult guy to beat, so yeah, definitely surprised. I told you, Greg. Um, I told you, man. What did I say? I was telling you last night. I was like, he's going to whoop his ass. You know, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> well, I, when the fight was announced a few months back, I actually said I thought Brown would win the fight, and I talked myself out of it over time because I, I did think Brown would would be too too strong for him. But every time I, I, I thought about the fight, I just seen Barnett catching him at some point in the first round, and I thought if Barnett did what Overeem did and caught him once. Barnett would finish it and it wouldn't go any further so I talked myself out of it in the end but yeah, Brown, Brown looked good and that's I've I seen a, a wee stat just before we came on there uh, that's three fights Brown's had in 2013 he's fought just a little over six minutes in total in the cage and all three fights he won knockout of the night the guy's definitely legit uh, was you surprised at how quickly and easily Travis Brown finished Josh Barnett last night, Chris? No, I was, I mean, I was, to say I was surprised was an understatement. I was shocked. I mean, I mean, Josh, Travis Brown has turned me into a believer. I, I slightly, I was slightly edging him to beat Alistair Overeem, but not in the comeback, the amazing comeback fashion he did. The fact that he finished Josh Barnett before Josh Barnett could get going, I was just blown away. I mean, as soon as Josh Barnett gets a hold of you, I felt that he was going to that he was going to wear Brown down. I was surprised he shot. He was shooting him for takedown so early. I thought he was going to try and just try and clinch and dirty box him like he did to Frank Mir. And I thought he was going to try and use his jab a bit more because he had a better he was a better overall boxer than Travis Brown. But maybe that's just due to Travis Brown's speed and, and athleticism. And um, yeah, I was totally I was very surprised, blown away, and. I think Travis Brown could possibly be the. Put it this way: it's hard to. It's it's easy to say. Well, if well if Cain Velasquez gets him against the cage, that he's that he's going to do exactly what Overeem did. Well, it's also fair to say that Travis Brown, that if Cain Velasquez gets Travis Brown against the cage, that Travis Brown will elbow him to death like he did to Gonzaga and Josh Barnett. So. Travis Brown is, you know, the heavyweight division has always been criticised for having, for being a thin division. Travis Brown is, he is making it very exciting again. I tell you that. It seems to be a Travis Brown's go-to move now. It's like, if you're a fighter going to face him now, you're going to be shit scared to get him against the cage and start trying to take him down there. You know, that's become a thing of takedowns now, using the cage. You know, if you're not a good wrestler, just use the fucking cage to take the guy down, you know, slowly and surely get, get the takedown. But no one's going to do that against Travis Brown no more. So in a way, he's effectively scared fighters from trying to take him down. So the only way now is you're going to get a good, strong wrestler who's going to shoot in on a good, strong double or something. Uh, Brian, was you surprised at how easily and quickly Travis Brown finished Josh Barnett last night? Well, I have a hard time talking about a fight longer than the actual fight happened. <laughs> so um, I'm running out of time quickly. So I'm just going to say, holy shit, Ten fuck. seconds left, Brian. <laughs> exactly. Holy shit, fuck. That was impressive. That's it. I'm done. Wow. Okay, Paul's fight. Travis Brown called out Fabricio Rodum last night. Do you think the UFC should make that fight, Greg? Um, what's your thoughts on that fight also? It looks like it's definitely getting made. Um, Dana said that verdum has got to fight again before uh, Kane recovers. So it's the only fight that makes sense. Winner of that uh, fights for the belt um, I think it'll be a good fight I, I'm probably still slightly edging towards Verdun to win it I must admit but I like the fight Chris do you think the UFC should make that fight um, what's your thoughts on that fight also well not only should they make it they want to make it they wanted Verdun to fight again because Kane's out for at least the first half of next year due to shoulder surgery so yes they want. They wanted Verdun to fight to fight again, to fight the winner of this fight when he said he was willing to wait for Kane and looks like that fight's going to happen and I love it. I mean, originally I was expecting Vadoom to beat either Barnett or um, Barnett and Brown, but now I tell you what, my, I would probably slightly edge Travis Brown for that fight. You know, it's, I'm not, obviously that's for another day, but what are my thoughts? 
very, I mean, you know, people can say what they want about Badoom striking. You know, the only guy to knock this guy, the only man to knock this guy out clean is, is Junior Dos Santos. I mean, who doesn't get knocked out by Junior Dos Santos? So, and, you know, again, you can compare their fights against Alistair Overeem. Travis Brown, you know, got pounded against Overeem, came back, but was very close to being finished. For, for Doom looked pretty good on his on his feet against Overeem. He did stand in the pocket, and okay, he did stall the fight several times, but what I'm saying is that Fabrizio Vadum striking is very underrated, So, but he's going against the beast, so he would be going against the beast, that is when that fight, when this fight gets made, so I'd be very interested for that fight, and that would be the perfect number one contender fight for the seemingly lacking of talent heavyweight division. Brian, do you think the UFC should make this fight? Uh, what's your thoughts on it also? Um, yes, it, it's it's the clear fight. We don't get clear fights very often in the UFC of, okay, this guy has to fight this guy. I mean, we're debating, we've debated the GSP uh, belt being freed up and who should fight, and we, we can still debate that. This one's pretty fucking clear. Um uh, my biggest concern is, will, will Vadum take the fight? Have we heard that officially? Because he seems very content on not fighting right now and just waiting for his title shot. And and I'm not the biggest Vadum guy. I I'm I love the guy for beating Fedor. Um, I'm grateful to the guy for beating Fedor. But I, I am not the biggest Vadum fan. And so I would have to probably favor Travis in this fight. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned he won't take the fight. Um, he seems so content on not fighting, and that that always bothers me out of a fighter. Um, or, or content not fighting the best uh, with Masalsi and uh, oh crap, um, a guy who got screwed by Bellator just recently uh, was very content staying within the small, shallow end of the pool. Um, Eddie Alvarez. Alvarez. Um, I always kind of put Verdum in that class of being content not being the best, not fighting the best. So he, he, ha, he has evolved. He's, he's a lot better. His, his striking doesn't suck like it used to, and uh, his jiu-jitsu is damn near untouchable. So I, I like the fight. I, I hope I hope Verdum accepts his side because it, it is the only fight. It's the only fight in the heavyweight division for the top that makes sense right now, in my opinion. Okay, moving on to round four and uh, Salavis for the three main card boats last night. I'm just going to... Go through the salaries quickly for you. Chris Weidman got 200,000 show money, plus a potential 200,000 win bonus, which he received. Anderson Silva got 600 show money. Ronda Rousey got 50,000 show money and a potential 50,000 win money, which he received also. Misha Tate got 28,000 show money. Josh Barnett got 170,000 show money. And Travis Brown got 28,000 show money and 28,000 win bonus. Greg, what do you make of the salaries for the three major bouts from last night's UFC 168 card? The obvious one is that Ronda Rousey's underpaid. <laughs> um, Barnett, he has paid a lot, but the heavyweights are all paid like that. Heavyweights all get big money. Mark Hunt's on $160,000 a fight. Um, Seriously? Yeah, and Bigfoot, I think, is on 200000 a fight. So the, the heavyweights always get paid mega bucks. Um, looking at some of the other guys in other divisions, you've got Michael Bisbing. He's on 275,000 to show and 150,000 bonus. Machida's on 200,000 to show. So on that basis, Barnett is probably about right. And he's a draw, so it's difficult to say he doesn't justify it. But Ronda Rousey on 50,000 and 50,000. That her pay will go up soon, I would imagine. If you want to look on. Pound for pound, the biggest draws, what the UFC have got. Ronda Rousey is probably the UFC's biggest draw right now, even above John Jones. I would argue the same. She's potentially their biggest draw right now. Brian, what do you make of the three major bouts last night and their salaries they received? Um, well, we, we can't trust these numbers. Um, the state and athletic commissions require, depending on the state, for the UFC to turn in something. Um, I, I doubt with any any real um, I, I'm damn near positive 99.9 percent positive that Ronda Rousey is not leaving that fight with a hundred thousand in her pocket um, <laughs> you can probably damn near put a zero behind that she is gonna make a lot more money than a hundred thousand off that fight 
Um, and that's not, that's not even counting the bonuses, the fight of the night and the uh, submission of the night. She, she is going to make, I'm guessing she's going to make close to half a mil on that fight when it's all said and done. She's going to get a percentage of the pay-per-view. She's, she's set herself up that way. So these numbers we see in, that, in the past, we used to scream about, oh, that's bullshit, they shouldn't be, they're being screwed. We've had fighters come out clearly after the, the things like, no, I, I'm fine, guys. That's, it's, that's, that's not a real number. Uh, I do pretty damn well. It's, it's a non-issue. Um, now, back in the day when the Shamrocks were fighting, and yeah, they, they, they didn't make the money, but that, that's, that's, that's kind of, so be it. It's, it's tough. But we also have to look at is who signed the most recent contracts. A guy fighting his eighth fight on, a, on an eight-fight contract is clearly going to be a lot less than a guy's fighting his second fight on a new contract. As the market increases, so will the contracts. The contract is not set up to be a percentage of the market. Uh, if I sign a contract today, it's going to be, okay, five fights at 50000 If I sign that contract last year, maybe it's five fights at 40000 If it's the year before that, maybe it's five at 30000 So if I signed it in, in 2011 and I'm doing great and it's my fifth fight, Twenty thousand dollars. That's bullshit. That people are going to scream about it. Well, it, it's my last fight of, a, of, a, of an old contract. My new contract's probably going to be at sixty thousand because that's just where the market is. So it's it's hard to tell exactly when these guys sign the contract. Josh is a fairly newer signee, so he's going to be at the most recent market value. And I think Bisbing recently signed a contract, so that's probably why he has it fairly high too. But uh, Rhonda. I don't know if Rhonda's still on her Strike Force contract, but again, she has stuff built in where it's a non-issue. She she made more than a hundred thousand last night. I I'm damn near positive. Chris, what do you make of the salaries I mentioned? Well, first of all, just to add on a little bit of what Brian said, it is Dana White has said before he will never reveal to the to the public or the media exactly the exact numbers what fighters make because. That pulls in the wrong people who will, you know, as he's put it, you, suddenly you have brothers who you never knew you had, and you have cousins you never knew you had. So we'll never find out for, sh- for sure what fighters make. I do think that maybe they might be hiding Ronda Rousey's, <laughs> maybe they were hiding Ronda Rousey's pay a little bit for that, more than usual for that. I don't know why. Um, as for Anderson Silva, well, he is the he was the biggest star on this draw on this card. Now I know Ronda Rousey was on the card. But you know, but Anderson Silva, he was—he's just been around for longer, so more people knew who he was. You know, now I'm not saying that Ronda Rousey isn't a massive draw because she is, and a lot of people do know who she is. But you just can't get over that Anderson Silva's been around since 2005. So, um, so I could understand Anderson Silva's payout. I'm not surprised by Josh Barnett's. I mean, I mean, again, he's another guy who's been around forever. You know him. I mean, you know him as off. You know, capable of failing a piss test as he is as, as finishing guys, um, but you know him for being a character as well. And heavyweights do make a lot of money, as Greg said, because they're the heavyweights. So, as for as for the whole contract thing, um, well, I'm not so. I mean, it's always difficult to find out what Anderson Silva's sort of thinking because he because he just resents the media so much. Um, as far as his contract, and you know, I mean, we don't. As we talked about earlier, we don't think he'll finish this contract. But, you know, did his pay get affected? The fact that, you know, he's still relatively new with this with his 10-fight contract? For some reason, I don't think so. I mean, it's Anderson Silva, and this was a hugely important fight for the UFC. And Anderson Silva probably brought more attention to it. Well, arguably the most attention, I mean, by himself. You know, the fact they wanted to see him come back from the first loss of his career. Um, so the payout just didn't really surprise me and I'm sorry if I'm getting a bit of a non-answer here but again I just find it hard to really latch on to what to the numbers we are given because again the UFC keeps the real numbers to themselves ok moving on to our fifth and final round MMA Crypt of the Night Awards Chris who got knockout the night for you? Uh, Travis Brown no doubt about it I mean the fact it's not so much that the way he knocked him out, but it's who he knocked out. Josh Barnett, nobody finishes Josh Barnett, so, and that's all that really be said and done. 
Travis Brown won it for me. Uh, Greg, who got knocked out the night for you? Same again, uh, Travis Brown. That was an easy one to pick. Barnett's not an easy guy to finish, and he and it was brutal. Put him out. Ryan, who got knocked out the night for you? Same, same, no different. Same, same. Well, I'm going to go different from you guys. I'm going to go Uriah Hall. He didn't exactly knock Chris Lieber out, but he pretty much did. There's so much power. It wasn't exactly a fucking big hook that he set up. And not many people make Chris Lieber quit. Now, I know, Brian, you said he's on drugs before and whatnot. <laughs> he looks like a bit of his face. <laughs> that might have played a part. I don't know. We'll have to wait for the drug test. But not many people make Chris Lieber and say, I don't want to continue. That guy's got some power in his punches. That was impressive. Okay, on to our submission of the night. Chris, who got submission of the night for you? Well, I, this was one I knew from I knew from the word go as soon as the event finished. Ronda Rousey, I mean, not just, I mean, yes, she submitted Misha Tate before, but how could any fan not give her submission of the night after, you know, she attempted so many times, got reversed so many times, a couple of times she was in a, she was in a submission, a, Misha Tate had her in a submission, um, but she managed to get out of it every single time, and eventually she got her, she got her and her trademark submission. I don't, I don't think there's really an argument, to be honest. Greg, who got submission tonight for you? Same again. Um, there was only like, one other submission on the card, Jim Miller, and it was nowhere near as impressive as Ronda Rousey's submission. Brian, who got submission tonight for you? Now I'm going different. I'm going Jim Miller. Um, I thought Misha Tate was tired, and she tapped so quickly on that one, I thought it was due to, I mean, because she got beat up on that fight, so I figured she was more tired than the actual sub being a great sub. But Miller's sub came from nowhere. Um, I thought that was a finer sub, in my opinion. I just I didn't see him getting it from there. Um, limbs were all wrapped up in there. I'm like, eh, he might. He, holy shit, he's got it. And so I'm going Jim Miller just to be different. No, fuck that. No, I actually buy that. It is Jim Miller. <laughs> yeah, I could have got, I'm with you, Brian. I could have got Jim Miller. You know, he subbed a black belt as well. And just the way he did it, you know, he trapped him. He grabbed all his leg and he locked him down. It's the way he come over, like he's going to go for a triangle. And he just, he locked him in, he tricked him in. And it's perfect the way he did it. And when he did lock him in, there's no way he could escape. You know, like like you mentioned, Misha Tate was tired. She could have spun out if she chose to, gutted it out. Possibly she might have got her arm broken in the process. But there was no escaping. Jim Miller had him locked in like a fucking spider. It was like a fly in a spider's web. And he was fucking eating him. Okay, on to our fight of the night. Chris, who claimed fight of the night for you? Um... You know what, if Chris Lieben and Uriah Hall had gone to a second round and it would have played out much like the first, I would have had to give that, I, w- I would have given that fight of the night because just because of the heart of Chris Lieben and the accuracy of, your, of Uriah Hall. But it only went run, one round and I, I really enjoyed the Brandel-Dustin uh, Poirier fight, but that was pretty much one-sided. Um, again, I you know, I hate to be boring here, but I'd have to go with Misha Tate and Ronda Rousey simply because of the back and forth, you know. You know, it wasn't all stand-up, I understand that, but on the ground, you know, if you're a ground fighter, and I'm a fan of every aspect of martial arts, you have to, You there is no way you can't appreciate how those girls reversed, reverse positions, one's on top, one's in a submission, reverse, reverse, reverse. It was an amazing fight. I have to give that fight of the night. Greg, who claimed fight of the night for you? Uh, totally agree. Um, I really enjoyed the, the Poye Brandao fight as well. It was close for being fighting the night for me. If it went more than one round, possibly. But yeah, the the action in the Tate Rousey fight was just brilliant. Like like you said earlier, Daly yourself, I was out my seat at least four or five times, and you know you're watching a good fight when you're out your seat. Brian, who claimed fight the night for you? Uh, for me, it was Dustin Poirier, just because I had more riding on that fight of emotion. Uh, the Tate Rousey fight was a better fight. When you, when you say fight as far as being two parties. But I was more emotionally involved in the Dustin Poirier after the guy missing weight by eight pounds. So when he, he finished him, that, that was more important to me. That's That got me more amped. Just, it, was a, it was a major fuck you. And uh, negative or not, it was just a big it was a big fight for me. I was really excited about that fight. So that was my fight of the night. Um, I have to go Ronda Rose here versus Misha Tate. No surprise here. Um, I don't think there's any other fight that matched that fight on the card, in my opinion, in terms of excitement. And it also lived up to the expectations and exceeded what I expected from that fight. And as I mentioned, I was at my seat the whole fight, literally just yelling at the telly, crazy. 
Okay, sadly, that's a wrap for today's show. Uh, the MMA Crips Fighting Talk for UFC 168. Hope you all enjoyed the show. Be sure to check us out at www.mmacrypt.com. Yeah.